When I lived in Wyoming, one of the places that my family went to visit was Yellowstone. And I know many of you have been to Yellowstone. There is one geyser in Yellowstone, Old Faithful, that they can predict when it is going to go off. They know that if it is a two minute time in which all the water flows out of the geyser, that 55 minutes later, the geyser will blow up again. If it is four minutes, then it's going to be 90 minutes. And so if you want to see Old Faithful, you can go to the website and check in when the next time it's going to go off. That it's constant. That people, since they discovered Yellowstone, have known that that geyser will go off at a regular pattern. When we left Moses and the people, Moses had just asked God to show, show him God's glory. Show me your glory. And chapter 34 contains the story of being shown glory and what happens then when Moses and God talk about rewriting the Ten Commandments because those tablets busted. In that story in chapter 34, it begins with a prayer to God, describing who God is as a person, as, a, as an entity, as a mystery, giving characteristics to who God will be for the people. And those characteristics are that God will be merciful. So what does it mean to be merciful, right? It means to show kindness, right? It means to act in a forgiving way. It means that God is like that hostess that invites you into a party and gives you what you need to enjoy yourself. God is gracious. And God abounds in steadfast love and mercy. Sorry, I'll turn up the volume. <laughs> the guys are really loud, Old Faithful. Well, Old Faithful is the one in the car corner. solid and if you step off the path into that you will fall into 
the earth and into the water that is 250 degrees in temperature and will be scalded to death. So of course, as we're walking by that sign, do not stray from the path. Somebody's walking in the path, not the path, right? As the rangers are coming up to save them from dying. I like to think about the commandments, the rules that God gives us. As that same sort of path, right? That if you take the path that I lay out for you, if you follow these commandments, these ordinances, these rules, these guidelines, whatever word you want to use to talk about them, if you follow them, you're not going to stray from the path and fall into the act of the volcano and be scalded to death. Or as Reed liked to tell me back then, because this is when they decided that Yellowstone was going to blow someday, and when it blew, he told me very seriously as we were walking down the path, you know that we will be dead because we are in the danger zone. Well, that's good to know. We won't starve to death because of the mountains of clouds. We will just be over with right away. But I wonder if there's some truth to that. Like, if, if we ignore the ways that God has told us to live, do we become a people that are unkind and uncharitable and unwelcoming? Do we become a people that doesn't care about our neighbors, about our neighbors' children? Do we become a people who can't seem to even have decent conversations with each other anymore? But if we listen to the ordinances and the commands about how we are to organize our lives, how we are to be together as people, does that change how we look at each other? How we interact with each other? How we think about each other? Because that's part of what the rule book is about, right? All those chapters between now and we're going to get to the end of the story and we're going to skip books. Because all those chapters in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and parts of Exodus lay out these boundaries. They say, this is what makes you the people of God. Here are some of the rules, the ways to interact with others that make you a people that God looks on and loves. Now, some of the rules are crazy. Like, if your wife cheats on you, you can stone her to death. Um, some of the rules don't make sense to us, like how many of you are mixed in fabrics right now, right? Like, do you have cotton and wool and polyester? Some of the rules don't make sense to us. But if you look at the whole picture of the rules, if you look at the whole context, the idea is to say, these are the things that we know are good. We know help. Because when we look at the context of um, food eating, we know that there are foods that are better for us and worse for us. We know that there are foods that are healthy and unhealthy. So when the Bible was written, the list of those foods may be very different than the list we would create, right? But the idea behind it that this category, eating, is something that we need to take care of, that we need to think about, that we need to organize, that can change how we are, can help with our health and wellness, that can help with the environment. Thinking about how we eat can change the boundaries of what people see when they experience us as Christians. But we as Christians have said no to that rule. But that's another story. The point being that
that all these boundaries and rules created a people that lived in a way that set them apart as people who followed God. And what we're invited to do is enter that same story, to see the ways that we can embody a people and show others a people that follow God. That we can be a people that create a community that God wants to be faithful with. That God is willing to act for and with. Now, one of the things I love about this description of who God is and this renewal of covenant is that it's a God, our God, who is kind and compassionate. Because think about it. The descriptions we have and the stories we have and the stories we tell about powerful beings and other gods and about powerful humans are stories that aren't usually about kindness, compassion, about being loving and decent. The stories usually are about gaining something. And yet what God says, what God shows, is that we are to be merciful and gracious and forgiving. What a powerful statement to make in a world, a world where we seem to be fighting with each other over everything, to say, slow down. Slow your anger down and remember the graciousness and mercy, the kindness and compassion, the love. How would that change our interactions with each other and with our, in our communities if our first thoughts were about kindness and compassion and mercy, not our last thought? Would that change what we thought of when we went to the school board meeting to argue about mass? Would it change what happened in that meeting and how it happened? Because you have all seen the pictures, right, in the stories about the fights and battles over mass. But if we are truly Christians, then our goal is to follow those boundaries and rules that lay out how to be kind and compassionate and loving, that share with us that this is not easy, that being slow to anger is very hard. But the worth we get when we live within those boundaries is a society that changes and cares. That cares about the child whose family at home has immune compromised people. That cares about the child at home who has to worry about all the generations in their house. When we think with compassion and kindness and love first, we create a world that embodies that. And maybe that's what we're missing right now. We, like that man that the rangers had to go rescue, have created a world where everybody is stepping off the path and into the volcanic ash that you can fall through and be scalded to death in. And we need to take a step back, recenter ourselves, and stay on the path. Walk in the way of God, a God of graciousness, mercy, compassion, steadfast love, and faithfulness. Amen.